Welcome, little scientists. It's Miss Gisa, and I sure am glad you're here with me today for our read aloud. Today's story is going to focus on a fish. Does anyone know what kind of fish this is? This is salmon. Have you ever had salmon or seen a salmon? This week, we are going to be learning about the life cycle of a salmon. And our story today is called Salmon Creek, written by Annette LaBox and Karen Rexuk. These were Sumi's first memories, water over stones, the scent of creek. Darkness so complete she could barely imagine another world larger than the egg case enclosing her. Sumi was blind, but she could hear the wind whispering through the cedars. She could hear the creek stones lifting and falling as the salmon mothers built their nests. And if she pressed against the curb of her egg, she could hear her salmon mother singing, Home is the scent of cedar and creek. Home is the journey's end. At dusk, a bear wandered down to the creek. He sat on his haunches, feasting on salmon. Beneath the creek, Sumi turned in her egg, strained to hear from her little stone bed a song of a journey, a seed of a dream. I followed the stars in the river's pull. I followed the salty air. The sea was wide and beautiful, but my heart wasn't there. And later, as the salmon mothers drifted gently downstream, their songs grew fainter. A windstorm shook the last of the maple leaves from the trees. The leaves fell on the mossy log, then joined the creek. A flock of eagles picked at the salmon bones left by the bear. The scent of salmon lingered in the air. Sumi slept until midwinter. When she woke, she could see. She had two large eyes and a delicate tail. She carried a yolk sack beneath her. Thrusting her tail against her sack, she pushed and pushed till her egg case split open and she tumbled headfirst into the creek. She was as small as a pine needle, scared and alone. She hid beneath the gravel till her strength had grown. When her egg sack was empty, she swam upward, followed by a school of fry. She widened her nostrils, memorized each scent, moss and fern and cedar, maple and damp earth, her birth creek home. As the days became warmer, algae grew on Salmon Creek. Ducks dabbled in the bright green bloom, dragonflies and mayflies fed there, and the fry fed on insects and larvae. Sumi swam in quiet pools, hunted among schools of silver fry, hid from the heron's watchful eye. Summer turned to fall. When winter came, snow fell on Salmon Creek. A raccoon crept silently through the icy stream. Beneath a root, Sumi woke and slept, dreaming of spring. Spring arrived again with a torrent of water, rushing, rumbling, roaring, tumbling. The current carried the fry head first downstream, past ducks and herons with hungry beaks, past gulls and dippers eager to feast. The creek hurled the fry over rocks and sweepers, tossed them against the roots and tingled creepers. Sumi's fins grew battered and her tail torn, but the current drove her on and on and on till she reached the river where the banks grew steeper, the rapids stronger, the water deeper. As she swam down the river, her side stripes faded, her skin secreted a fine mucus coat, her body grew longer and sleeker and stronger and one morning she woke to find herself a smolt. She swam past factories and farms and forests. She swam past tugboats and log booms and small towns. She swam past docks and cottages and children playing till she came to a place where the river meets the sea. She circled the estuary, gazed out at the bay to the water beyond where her new home lay. Then she smelled something sweeter than her birth creek in spring sweeter than the fragrance of cedar and stones, a 
a salt sweet memory buried deep in our bones, the sea. As she tasted salt water, her body felt strange. Little by little, her insides changed. Then she joined a school of salt drinking smolts, ready at last to swim to the sea. On sunny days, when the sea was filled with a pale green light, Sumi herded herring into sea caves or lazed in beds of kelp. She learned to dodge the nets of fishermen and dive from whales and seals. She feasted on sand lance and candlefish and shrimp-like creatures called krill. The krill turned her flesh a brilliant pink. As the months passed, her body grew longer, her scales brighter, her muscles stronger. And then one summer, everything changed. Perhaps it was the eggs forming deep inside her that made Sumi yearn for the creek of her birth, that made her remember the scent of damp earth or an algae bloom on a summer night or the taste of a mayfly caught mid-flight. Then Sumi set out for the stream of her birth. She followed the stars in the pull of the earth. Her heart racing, she traced her journey homeward, back to the place where the river meets the sea. The estuary was crowded. She was not alone. Thousands of salmon were heading home. They entered the river, spellbound, scales glistening, life quickening within them. River streaming over their gills, belly swelling with eggs and milt, no longer eating, no longer sleeping, fighting the river's will. Sumi climbed up rapids and leaped over falls. She dove under logs and roaring torrents. She rode the currents, her muscles straining, her fins tattered, her strength waning. But she wouldn't stop, she couldn't stop, till she came to a creek with a wonderful smell and she swam up that creek as if caught in a spell. A silver gang of salmon raced by her, and among them, Nullock, searching for a mate. He swam towards Sumi, nuzzling her sides. Sumi leaped from the creek, fins outspread, arched her back and shot ahead. Nullock followed her leap, shadowed each fin stroke. As Sumi swam in fresh water, her body felt strange. The salmon around her began to change. The males grew fangs and fierce hooked noses. Their scales became the color of roses. Their crowns grew green as leaves in spring. And then one morning, they swam to a place where an ancient cedar leaned over a stream, where the water ran a pure pale green, where the stones shimmered with a golden sheen. And Sumi knew by the smell and the taste that this was her birthplace the place she loved best, a perfect place to build her nest. She lay on her side, waved her tail like a cat. She slapped the water till the stones parted. And in the hollow, she laid thousands of eggs like pale orange suns sinking into the silt. Then Nullock showered her eggs with milt and the water of the creek flowed white like milk. And quickly, gently, Sumi flicked her tail and the gravel drifted into the nest, covering her eggs like secrets. Sumi and Nullock drifted in the shallows. They were spawned out, exhausted. Their sides were battered, their fins torn, their skin had thickened, their scales worn. But they had chased a dream and caught it. They had swum all the way to the sea and back. Sumi circled the creek guarding her eggs. She bared her curved teeth slapped her tail, scared off pairs of spawners from her red. Sumi gazed at the sky. It was radiant, a deep blue-green. She could hear the wind whispering through the cedars. She could hear the creek stones lifting and falling as the salmon mothers built their nests. Small insects nestled in the folds of her skin, and later as she drifted gently downstream, Sumi sang to her eggs. Home is the scent of cedar and creek. Home is the journey's end. At dusk, a bear wandered down to the creek. It sat on its haunches, feasting on salmon. A windstorm shook the last of the maple leaves from the trees. The leaves fell on the mossy log, then joined the creek. A flock of eagles picked at the salmon bones left by the bear, the scent of salmon lingered in the air. 
the life cycle of a coho salmon. There are five different species of salmon that began their lives in the water of the Pacific Northwest, sockeye, chinook, pink, chum, and coho. Each species has a unique appearance as well as different spawning habits and life cycles. This timeline shows the life cycle of the coho salmon. In the late fall, usually November, the female coho lays eggs in the gravel of her freshwater birth creek. The male coho fertilizes the eggs with a white substance called milt. 11 or 12 days later, the male and female salmon die. In December or January, the eggs hatch. The tiny salmon called alevins remain in the gravel, living on food from their yolk sac. By March or April, the young salmon lose their yolk sacs. They are now known as fry. The fry swim into the open water of the creek to hunt for food. They have dark stripes on their sides called par marks, which help to camouflage them from predators. In late April or May, after spending a year in the creek, the young, now called smolts, begin to migrate down the river. The dark par marks slowly fade and a silver coating develops on their scales. This process of adapting to seawater is called smoltification. The smolt's journey to the estuary, where the river meets the sea, may take days or even months, depending on how far away their birth creek is. There's plenty of food in the estuary, and as they pass through, the smolt eat as much as they can, growing larger and stronger before swimming to the sea. By late June, when the smolts enter the sea, they have developed dark blue-black backs with silvery sides and bellies. Most of their par marks have disappeared. The smolt's new appearance allows them to blend in with the ocean environment. The young coho spend 16 to 18 months in the sea, eating and growing. Early the next summer, the fully grown coho began their homeward migration. It may take them up to six months to reach fresh water. As the coho enters fresh water, they stop eating and live on the fat stored in their bodies. Their skin becomes thick and leathery. The male coho develops a hooked snout. The female's body swells with ripening eggs. By the time the coho reach their birth creek in November, they have developed dark red sides and dark green backs and heads. The female coho lays her eggs in the gravel of the creek and the cycle begins again. Join us for more about the salmon life cycle this week. Thank you for joining me today. Remember to like and subscribe to support our channel.